Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining our session today, Picking the Right Mac for Your Workflow with Matthew Pulsifer. Before we get started, we'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. This session is being recorded and will be sent via email in the coming days. Everyone who's joined today has been muted, but if you have any questions, please feel free to add them to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We will save time at the end of our session to answer any questions you might have. Now I am going to pass things over to Matthew to introduce himself and kick things off. Thanks, Holly. So this is picking the right Mac for your workflow. What to look for when selecting Mac compute. Um, quick rundown of the agenda today. We're going to talk a little bit about myself and Mac Stadium, why we benchmark, how we benchmark, the results and where to find them, some of the insights and findings we found from benchmarking different Mac models, how to use those results in helping choose to find the right Mac for you, a quick rundown of Mac hardware available from Mac Stadium, some of the things that we're looking forward to with benchmarks in the future, and we'll open up for questions and answers at the end. So a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Matthew Pulsifer, and I'm a product manager at Mac Stadium for Mac Cloud Infrastructure. I've got over 10 years of experience in solutions architecture, virtualization, and product management. My passion is finding ways to solve complex problems with applied technology, and as a result, I'm an avid Mac user. A little bit about Mac Stadium. We deliver secure private cloud solutions to simplify Mac for business through automation, security, customization, and virtualization. So why do we benchmark? Well, first off, we love Macs. We love Mac hardware, and we love playing with Mac hardware. So it's always good to get an idea of what's out there. But we also have customers that are constantly asking, well, which Mac should I get? How does each model impact my work? And there are a lot of reviews out there readily available online for Apple products. And they're mostly taken from a consumer or even like a professional content creator kind of a perspective. Um, what we need is analysis and reviews from the perspective of someone looking for cloud-hosted Mac use, um, specifically around CI, CD, and development tasks, because that's what a lot of people use hosted Mac compute for. So our goals in benchmarking are to measure the performance of each Mac desktop model, comparing the results to the Mac Mini with M1 as a baseline, so we can kind of get an idea of which Macs deliver more performance and how much more performance they deliver as well as determine the best real world applications for each model. Before we go any um, further, we do have a poll question. What is your biggest fear when purchasing a machine? And I believe the answers for this one are whether it's not having enough performance or if you're spending too much on unnecessary hardware. And we'll give it a little bit of time and we'll kind of once we get the poll results, we'll discuss them and we'll get into the uh, details. All right, so we came back 70-30 split. Not having enough performance is the 30% and spending too much on unnecessary hardware is the 70%. So that's kind of interesting. Um, it makes a lot of sense, right? You wanna make sure that if you're spending a lot on a Mac that you're getting what you pay for. And hopefully some of these benchmark results can help us kind of dive into that. So next we'll talk about how we benchmark. So these are all, the, most, the majority of this presentation focuses on the reference results that we have published on our um, documentation pages in September, 2023. These were all tested using Mac Stadium hosted machines. So it's a realistic test of available hardware that Mac Stadium offers. We ran all the tests with Mac OS Ventura and Xcode 14 as those were the newest available at the time of testing. And to ensure consistency in the results, we took the best result out of three tests with 10 minutes of cooldown between runs. So we made sure that the thermal impacts and other um, potential impacts were uh, accommodated for with each machine when we tested it. 
We use a series of synthetic benchmarks on a Mac in a specified time period to predict performance in a data center environment for a professional user. And to do that, we use Xcode Benchmark, Geekbench CPU Multicore, Geekbench Compute, which is a GPU test, and Cinebench. And we'll go into a little bit of detail as to why we use each one and how we use each one. So Xcode Benchmark is a standard benchmark that compiles a very large code base of commonly used CocoaPods libraries. And it's maintained by Maxim Aramenko, an iOS developer, to compare general Xcode compilation performance across machines. So the goal of this is to just have a standardized project that runs Xcode and does it. It's a very large project, so we can get an idea of how quickly Xcode compiles on a given machine. The results are measured in time and seconds. And in this case, as stated before, this was run using macOS Ventura and Xcode 15 in September 2023. Now, since we published these results, they did update it to run against Xcode 15, and the results do change. So if you were to download and run this now, the newer results aren't directly comparable. We did do a few newer tests that we'll talk about at the end of this on a limited subset of our models. Um, but that's just something to keep in mind. The results that we have are good for comparing machines against each other in the test results that we published. Next, we have Geekbench CPU, which is focused on the multi-core result um, in our data set. Geekbench CPU measures CPU performance using synthetic real-world tasks, such as compression, image processing, and encryption. The multi-core result was used because Apple differentiates different models by the number of cores, and they do have equivalent models between generations. So if I were to take an eight core M1, I could compare it to an eight core M2, and the general performance impact can also be used between those two models to determine um, the differences in architectural performance between M1 and M2 as a result. Um, the other thing that's interesting about Geekbench CPU in particular is that it's built around real world tasks. So this allows for hardware acceleration and specific application specific silicone, silicon um, that's built into Apple Silicon. There's a lot of optimizations under the hood and this uses all of the optimizations available because it's using optimized libraries for real world tasks. Um, for this, we ran all benchmarks with Geekbench 6. Then we have Geekbench Compute, which is a GPU-focused test for graphics performance, um, specifically using ex GPU accelerated compute tasks. When we ran this, we used the Metal benchmark because it is the most optimized API for Apple platforms. Um, now, there are two different versions of this test, OpenCL and Metal. Um, if you run an OpenCL benchmark, the results are not comparable to Metal results. So OpenCL's cross-platform, you can run this on other platforms such as PC and other mobile device platforms, but you can't take a score generated with OpenCL and compare it to Metal. However, Metal is the most optimized for Apple and we're Apple focused, so we went with that um, for comparing these machines. Additionally, all benchmarks were run using Geekbench 6. Finally, we have Cinebench. Cinebench is another CPU test, however, it doesn't have real world um, application accelerated libraries driving it. Um, it's just pure math, software rendering, no task specific pipelines or um, optimizations. So it's a very raw benchmark and it's also cross-platform, which is useful. But part of the reason for including this is to get just an idea of absolute performance of the chipset and determine the impact of application specific optimizations on real world um, tasks. In this case, we used Cinebench R23, um, which was the newest version available when we ran these tests. Now, as far as I know, the newest version of Cinebench does have some more accelerated workloads. And when we rerun these in the future against newer hardware and newer software versions, we'll take these things into account. So next we'll get to the results, but first we have another poll question. Which architecture does your Mac have? And we'll give you a minute or two to answer and we'll kind of go over the results and we'll talk about the impact of the different architectures.
the results are in, and it's actually a pretty interesting split. Uh, the majority of you, or a plurality of you, have uh, moved on to Apple Silicon, which is something I highly recommend, and we'll get into why in a second. Um, but we still have 38% running on Intel still. And um, the Intel Macs are still very good machines, but there's a lot of um, optimizations and things that Apple's done in Apple Silicon that we'll kind of discuss. And it looks like 15% of the response don't have a Mac yet. Threw the yet on there because, you know, it's a good platform. But honestly, even if you don't use a Mac as your everyday machine, hosted Mac computes a very good uh, way to access the capabilities of Mac. So a quick rundown of the results and where to find them. This slide kind of shows some of the summary results for our most popular standard machines. So we have the Intel machine here at the bottom. Apple Silicon, even the base model M1, is faster than the Intel in every test. Uh, one of the things we did here is we established a multiplier. So this multiplier is intended to represent the percentage difference in performance compared to a Mac mini with M1. The, because the M1 chip is very common, it's a good baseline for performance. That's how we, or why we decided to establish it that way. Um, there are a couple of insights here that we'll get into in future slides, but generally speaking, um, newer architectures are faster, but also additional cores equate to a pretty substantial increase in both raw and real world performance. Um, something else I'll call out here that again, we'll kind of talk a little bit more when comparing the Mac mini M1 to the Intel machine, and this was the fastest available Mac mini with Intel, the Cinebench score is actually very close. So this is raw compute. However, the Geekbench result was 23% better on the M1. And that again is driving more application specific real world tasks. And the Xcode benchmark was even faster on the M1, which implies a few things we can get into, but multi-core is very important. Um, to general computer performance. Everything on the Mac is very optimized for multi-thread operations. So a couple of other insights, and we'll just go through them in the results. M2 versus M1. M2 is approximately 15 to 20% faster than M1 per core. So if your applications are primarily single-threaded, um, you can expect a 15 to 20% increase regardless of which model um, appears. Xcode benchmark performance directly correlates to the number of cores in the machine. This was very interesting because if you're familiar with computer hardware, you can't always assume that adding cores means more performance. Well, turns out Xcode's pretty well optimized for multi-thread execution. So if you get more cores, you get faster builds. If you get a 10-core machine, it's roughly 20% faster than an 8-core machine of the same generation. Another interesting insight is that Xcode benchmark performance correlates well to Geekbench CPU results. This indicates that Xcode is very well optimized for Apple Silicon. You might expect this because it is an Apple product, but at the same time, it's a very complex and um, different pipeline than what Macs are typically used for in the more content creation focused applications. And the other thing that is useful to know here is that if you see Geekbench CPU multi-core results, you can use it as a rough proxy for general Xcode performance. So if you're looking at other benchmark results available out there, as long as you're looking at consistent results between um, the same set of machines, the general difference in those will roughly correlate to the general difference in Xcode performance. And the last point, Intel is obsolete. And the reason that we're so confident in saying this, well, the fastest Intel Mac mini is slower than the slowest Apple Silicon machine. And that applies to every test, especially when it comes to GPU performance. Um, going back a couple slides, you can see that the M1 is 80% faster at GPU um, compute tasks than Intel at least when using Metal, but if you're on the Apple platform, you're probably using Metal. So 
Next, we'll talk about how to choose the right Mac for you. The first thing to do is measure your workflows. What are you doing? CI, CD, and general system performance, because Geekbench CPU benchmarks correlate pretty tightly to Xcode performance. It's all tied down to the CPU performance, multi-core CPU performance of the machine. The other thing is that if you're doing creative applications, machine learning, and certain CI CD pipelines, such as gaming and shader compilation, GPU performance can also be very impactful. The other question that I think is worth asking, especially in the iOS development space, what do your users currently use? If your entire team has MacBook Pro with M2 Pro, like say the 12 core model, do you really want to get a hosted machine that's slower? So by pulling your users and seeing how their individual machines are performing, that can help inform what machine to get. Um, with Mac Stadium, you can mix and match hardware in a single environment as well. So if you have some, let's say you were doing game CI-CD pipelines and you're building some libraries that are graphic focused and other libraries that are not, you can get very heavy GPU instances and use those um, for your shader compilation and other libraries that require GPU intensive compute. And you can do more CPU focused instance, save a little bit of money and um, prioritize performance where it counts by running those on lower end machines. We also have Intel available still if needed for legacy applications. And while Intel is obsolete, there are a lot of Intel Macs out there as we saw in our polls. And sometimes you'll want to run or test on those machines as well. And that allows you to customize your Mac cloud with machines that fit your needs. The long and short of it though, if you get more cores and a higher end machine, you do get more performance. Um, they're not just selling more expensive machines to sell more expensive machines. If you do get an M2 Pro with 12 core, you are getting approximately 4%, 40% more performance in general compute tasks than an eight core M2 Pro machine. So with that, we've got one more poll question. What do you primarily focus on when selecting a Mac? Like what filters do you kind of drive the beginning of your decision? Is it total processing speed? Is it the RAM capacity of the machine? The storage capacity of the machine? Or are you just focused on performance per dollar? Interesting. So nobody said storage capacity. We had 30%, 33% of you said total processing speed, 7% said RAM capacity, which was actually kind of lower than what I expected, and then 60% said performance per dollar. Makes a lot of sense. You, if you're working in CI CD workflows in particular, time is money. So being able to execute your builds as quickly as possible means more capacity. It means more ability to have developers working on different things and less developer time, which is expensive, wasted on sitting around for builds. Um, performance per dollar is also very important because you want to make sure you're getting your money's worth. Uh, you don't just want to spend a lot of money on something that's not necessarily any faster or doesn't get you any benefit um, than something that is a little bit cheaper. RAM surprised me because when you run out of RAM, things tend to bog down a lot. However, maybe some of this is because Apple Silicon is very efficient with RAM. Um, they're still selling eight gig laptops on the low end. Not something I would do, but they do it and people are happy with it, which is interesting. So with that, let's talk a little bit about the standard Mac hardware that we offer. Um, down here in the bottom right corner is the Geekbench multi-core CPU result, which we establish as a good proxy for general performance. So here we've got the M1 medium, which is our 16 gig RAM, one terabyte SSD, kind of our mainstream model. It's still available in M1 from us, but the rest of our lineup is either Intel or M2 series chipsets. Uh, but what you can see here is that 
generally you get what you pay for when you add cores. An eight core CPU M1 as our baseline at 100% or 1x. The Intel, as we've kind of focused on earlier, is now obsolete in the Apple world with a 23% performance reduction. And then M2s, the base model M2, we did test these two machines separately and this one came slightly ahead. It's kind of within a margin of error, but you're looking at 15 to 20% depending on the task. However, what's interesting is that if you go up to the 10 core CPU, which has more performance cores than the base model M2 with the eight core CPU, you do get that 20% increase. So now you're at 40% faster than the base model M1. Um, the 12 core CPU has the same impact. Now it's 20% over this one and a total of 67% over the original M1 baseline. Um, additionally, if you are focused on GPU performance, every iteration of the M2 Pro adds GPU cores. And we found that that correlates very directly as well if you go look at our full results. So if you get a 19 core GPU, you're getting almost double the performance for graphical tasks compared to a base model M2. Finally, we have the Mac Studio. Now you might ask, why don't you have the M2 Max? Well, the M2 Max model has the same CPU as the M2 Pro 12 core. Um, the GPU performance is substantially larger. However, this is a larger, wider machine and most of our customers aren't doing GPU focused tasks. So our cost to host it is larger. If you're thinking about M2 Max and you're doing CI/CD workflows, the M2 Pro M2 XL model that we offer is a great alternative. However, if you are doing GPU-based workloads, the M2 Ultra is an absolute barn burner. It is two of the M2 Max chipsets effectively bridged together. So as a result, you get 24 cores of CPU, which is excellent for compute. You get 60 cores of GPU, which is triple that of the M2 Pro model. And we've also stacked it with quite a bit of RAM and SSD space. But as you can see, you actually do get what you pay for when you add cores. 2.4, 2.38 times the performance of a base model M1. And a substantial jump up over the standalone 12 core model Mac M2 Pro. So looking forward, now there's a lot of buzz about M3 and you might wonder, well, why haven't we covered it? Well, when we ran these, <laughs> and we'll get to the poll question here in a second. When we ran these, M3 wasn't available. We did do another limited subset of the uh, tests again with the new M3s. And we'll get into the results here, but first we've got a bit of a quiz question. Which machine is faster at Xcode? The M2 Ultra or the M3 Max? Let's see the results. Oh, it popped up again. All right. I don't necessarily see um, the results here, but I can give you the answer. The M2 Ultra is still the fastest machine. Um, that was actually kind of a point of uh, comparison, or the, uh, there was a lot of buzz in the media about M3 Max. It looks like 55% of you got it correct. <laughs> there was a bit of uh, uproar about how the M3 Max is more performant or matches the M2 Ultra. And what we found is that the M3 Max is just a little bit slower than the M2 Ultra still. So we'll get to that in the next slide. To kind of give a rundown of what we did though, we got one of each of the newest MacBook Pro models with M3 and we retested it against our current standard machines. Uh, we retested the existing standard machines because since we ran these initial set of full benchmarks in September, um, Sonoma came out, Xcode 15 came out and Xcode benchmark came out that kind of changed the uh, results and the validity of the results when testing in older versions. So we could have a fair comparison. 
Additionally, we add a few AI benchmarks, and we're going to hopefully expand on these in the next full round of benchmarking. But what we found was that in real world tasks, it's kind of interesting. So as you would expect, M3 per core is about 15 to 20% faster than M2. Very similar to the jump between M1 and M2, maybe a little bit less impactful in practice, like it's a little less fast by comparison. But what's interesting is that Apple already kind of has a 20% step ladder when it comes to their different chip SKUs. So if you were to get an M2L with Mac Stadium, which has the M2 Pro 10 core, you get roughly equivalent performance to a base model M3. The one that was really odd was the M3 Pro. A lot has been said in the media about the M3 Pro as well. The M3 Pro is only 6 to 11% faster than the M2 Pro 12 core. Uh, you can read our blog post for a little more detail, but that's because Apple re-architected the M3 Pro to have fewer performance cores. So even though each core is faster, you're only getting a slight improvement in performance. And depending on the benchmark, it might even be about the same or slightly slower. So we go into a little more detail on that in the blog post. The M3 Max, as a lot of people have said, is very close to the M2 Ultra in performance, but it doesn't quite reach um, the M2 Ultra. In every test we ran, the M2 Ultra was still faster. Now, the individual cores, if you're doing something single-threaded, you might be able to get an upset on that. However, it's really hard to beat just the sheer number of performance cores that the M2 Ultra brings to the table. So the rundown of this is that you can get M3 performance now, you just need to pick the right model. And really that means a step up. Unfortunately, we don't have M3 Ultra results yet because there's no Mac Studio, but rest assured when it comes out, we will be doing that. And as I'd said, we're waiting on the minis and the studios for M3 to do another full set of benchmarking. And we'll also include some of the legacy models when we do this, as opposed to just our current standards when we do that. We will also look at incorporating some more application-specific benchmarks for machine learning. We did stable diffusion in this most recent um, M3 benchmarking set. And hopefully there are some things we can do with LLMs as well, possibly around Apple's new MLX framework, which is a very optimized framework for machine learning tasks and AI models. So with that, let's go to questions. It looks like we have a few in the Q&A. So first question, are the benchmarks run on bare metal? Yes. All of these benchmarks were run in Mac Stadium bare metal um, as they would be if you were to just go ahead and get a bare metal machine from us. If you don't have a Mac yet, what's the number one reason that you should switch? It really honestly depends on what you're trying to do and who you are. If you're a developer, the Mac gives you a fantastic Unix-based platform with a great terminal that, where everything just works. Um, and that's a great reason to switch over from Windows by itself. Additionally, compared to a Linux workstation, the Mac has a lot of things that also just work. You get standard desktop applications. Apple's application suite is something I really like. As far as general users, Apple Silicon's incredibly efficient. Uh, I'm shocked at how good the battery life is on the MacBook Pro. So that's kind of my question or answer. It depends, but it's a great platform. Definitely try it if you have not. Can you link the blog post you're mentioning, M3 versus M2? Yes, we will post it. We actually did it as a series of two blog posts because we had a bit of a delay, as did everyone else, in getting our M3 Max machine in. Um, it looks like the link for that is maxstadium.com slash blog slash M3 dash max dash benchmarks for our M3 max review, which is probably the most interesting of them, but we still covered a full rundown of each model. Will you do benchmarks for Xcode running in VM? That's a great question. Um, we have our own virtualization platform uh, called Orca, and that's something that we will run 
in the future when we run our benchmarks? How, can, and maybe we'll even do a separate post on it, just detailing the impact of virtualization on performance. Um, to give a quick answer on that, virtualization is never going to be faster than bare metal. However, what we have found generally is that the I Apple hypervisor framework, which all Apple Silicon virtualization platforms are built on, is very performant. And while there is a performance impact, and it, you have to separate the performance impact of running in virtualization altogether versus the reduction in cores associated with the machine, it, the performance impact is really quite minimal because it's so optimized. Are there any differences between RAM usage in M1, M2, and M3? Are there efficiency gains between these architectures? RAM usage, um, between Intel and Apple Silicon, there's a substantial difference in RAM usage. I, what I believe they do to accomplish this is just a lot of in-memory compression and integrated silicon that just rapidly decompresses without impacting the main compute performance. So between Intel and Apple Silicon, yes. Between M1, M2, and M3, not as much. What, where you see more of the impacts on RAM usage are with new OS and Xcode releases. Um, so as time goes on, you know, RAM usage generally increases. Apple's very efficient. Um, one thing I have heard is that Xcode 15 is quite a bit heavier, though. Um, we've got one other question here. Performance hit on VM from NUMA. We will have to dig into that and um, get back to you on that. I believe, well, as I'd said differently, virtualization runs very differently on Apple Silicon than it did on Intel in the past. Um, because all of the virtualization solutions that are able to virtualize Mac OS on Apple Silicon are built around Apple's hypervisor framework. And I know that hardware pass-through runs differently and in a lot of ways more directly on Apple Silicon when compared to the other virtualization frameworks commonly run on Intel. Okay. As there are no other questions, uh, Matthew, thank you so much. And I want to thank our audience for joining us today. Um, we will be following up um, with this uh, recording and an email to you in the next few days. And we will also include the links to those blogs that were asked for. So thank you again for your time today. And we look forward to uh, hosting you on a future webinar.